Attawabderon peoples, all of whom have long-standing relationships to the land of southwestern Ontario and to the City of London. The First Nations communities of our local area include Chippewa of the Thames First Nation, Oneida Nation of the Thames, and Munsee Delaware Nations. In our region, there are 11 First Nations communities, as well as a growing Indigenous urban population. King's University College values the significant historical and contemporary contributions of local and regional First Nations and all the original uh, peoples of Turtle Island. So good evening and uh, welcome. It's good to see so many people out on a cold, uh, cold winter night. Um, on behalf of King's Campus Ministry, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to this Veritas lecture during the week of Prayer for Christian Unity. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Jim Pancho. I serve as the pastoral counselor on the campus ministry team, and I'm also the coordinator of this Veritas series. During, in the Veritas series, we endeavor to foster learning and dialogue by gathering our community together as we seek to live lives of faith and justice. Tonight's lecture is co-sponsored by the Ecumenical Commission of the Diocese of London, and we're grateful for their partnership along with our other sponsors. For those who are not aware, uh, there is a donation box uh, that you passed on the way in, and you will pass on the way out, hint, hint. And uh, any donated funds uh, are, uh, will support the refugee initiatives that are here at King's uh, Campus Ministry and, and Christ the King Parish. So the theme of this year's series is, series is renewal, and it's drawn from the prophecy of Isaiah. In Isaiah 40:31, the prophet declares, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. In the midst of the many challenges face, facing our nation and our communities of faith, we will be presented with opportunities to consider and evaluate where we find our hope and our direction for the future. Without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker for this evening. Since planning this talk, Bishop Linda Nichols was elected as the Anglican Primate of Canada, and we're just thrilled. And now Archbishop Linda Nichols has been uh, ac actively engaged over many years in ecumenical dialogue since 1989. And uh, she has been the co-chair of the Anglican Roman Catholic Dialogue in Canada and is a member of the Anglican Roman Catholic International Commission, or ARCIC III. Tonight, Archbishop Nichols will explore the signs of hope for unity in her lecture, That They May Be One. Please join me in welcoming Archbishop Linda Nichols. Good evening. Well, it is a privilege to be asked to join you again for one of the Veritas Lectures at King's College. Tonight, we are in the midst of the week of prayer for Christian unity, a week set aside between the feasts of the confession of St. Peter and the conversion of St. Paul, to encourage Christians around the world to pray for Christian unity. St. Peter, the rock on which the early church was built and of course, the ancestor of the papacy. And St. Paul, the passionate advocate for the extension of the gospel to all people, Gentile and Jew, the icons of the universal church bookend this week of prayers, reminding us that God's love and message of grace and forgiveness are given freely to all. Why is this week necessary or, frankly, even still relevant? Christian unity has been elusive from its earliest days. From the first gathering of the disciples, Jesus dealt with squabbles and differences among them, from claiming status as the best to sit at Jesus' right hand, to misunderstanding Jesus' mission and ministry, to the betrayal of Judas and Peter, Jesus knew intimately the challenge of holding together 
those who followed him. And so in John 17, in what we call the high priestly prayer, Jesus prays that they may be one as you and I are one, Father. As they gathered in the upper room on his last night, it is a summation of Jesus' intimate unity with God offered to all who follow him. A unity that embraces different responsibilities and roles, a unity with the Holy Spirit, dynamic, responsive, and committed to a vision of God's world together. But somehow always elusive for human beings. Acts 15 shows the challenge of sustaining relationships as disagreements arose between Gentiles and Jews in the fledgling church. Early centuries saw splits between East and West over doctrinal definitions. Further splits and tensions over authority and jurisdiction. A reformation that split Protestants and Catholics and subsequent splits and splinters of denominations over ministry and sacraments. Why is this week needed? because we have yet to realize the promise and command of Jesus to love one another and witness to the world a life-giving unity without demanding uniformity. Now, I speak to you not as an expert, but as one whose life and ministry has drawn me into a passionate defense of the need for such unity. Although raised a cradle Anglican, my life experiences of evangelical churches, Christian community at a boarding school in India, engagement in Anglican-Roman Catholic dialogue, and my work as a bishop all contribute to that passion. It has been a particular pain in recent years to see the inability of Christians facing the decline of sustainability of ministry and church buildings, their unwillingness to embrace a sharing of at least space together with others in the community. We are children of God, loved and embraced by the love of Jesus Christ, forgiven, renewed, and called by baptism to witness to that love where we are located with the gifts given to us. The last 20 years in the Anglican Communion have witnessed particularly bitter divisions. This is not, however, new to Anglicans. <laughs> the colonial spread of the Church of England around the British Empire and our attempts to share the gospel in other cultures quickly led to conflict. Robert Heaney, an Irish historian and Anglican theologian, recently wrote about our history and the promise of Anglicanism, describing it as a clash between the gift that Anglicanism might bring and what he calls Anglianism, a very English expression of the Anglican way that was challenged to enculturate where it landed. As someone who lived in India for a number of years, I certainly experienced Angli Anglianism imposed on a culture that certainly could have embraced the gospel in other ways. It was the Canadian Anglican Church that called for a conference of bishops to discuss the tensions created, a call that led to the first Lambeth Conference of Bishops in 1867 to discuss the Colenso affair. Bishop John Colenso in South Africa was espousing biblical and theological ideas deemed too far removed from the tradition and too sympathetic to the local culture. These needed discussion. And since then, discussions of marriage and divorce, polygamy, birth control, the role of women, and aspects of human sexuality have all raised questions and conflicts we Anglicans are experienced at living in and with tensions. 
Heaney points to conflict as being an essential feature of Anglican identity as we wrestle with the gospel incarnated in particular times and places. However, there is a difference now in the intensity with which division is advocated. With the rapidity of change around us, questions of identity are being raised more urgently. The changing role of women in the world is raising questions I think particularly for men, about their role in family and world. And what is acceptable in one culture is not in another. Political and economic globalization raises questions of national identity. Religious migration and ethnic shifts also raise questions of belonging and national identity. And in an all too human response, change brings fear and a desire for certainty and control. We are encouraged to solidify our identity by finding an enemy to blame and hate. Recently, just last week, I was at a meeting of the primates of the Anglican Communion, where we were reminded of the philosophy of Carl Schmitt, political philosopher who buttressed the rise of the Nazi party in the 1930s and 40s. In a letter to Schmidt, the author Leo Strauss described Schmidt's philosophy in this way, with apologies for the lack of inclusive language. Because man is by nature evil, he therefore needs dominion. But dominion can be established, that is, men can be unified, only in a unity against, against other men. Every association of men is necessarily a separation from other men, end quote. In other words, in order to find unity, we need an enemy. The effects of that philosophy led to the Holocaust and haunt both church and state as we see that polarization of enmity is increasing in the world around us almost 70 years after World War II. The lessons we thought we had learned continue to be undermined and challenged. The divisive politics of us and them that characterizes social and political change around us undergirds the use of violence to confirm identity by attacking the other. And that's not just in the state, it is also in the church. The capacity to live with difference is being rapidly reduced by rhetoric that makes difference into reasons for hatred and exclusion rather than learning, exploration, and inclusion. And of course, the instantaneous reality of the modern social media stirs up controversy in sound bites, images, and short rants that mitigate against the nuanced conversations needed to make and keep all parties human. Religious communities are not immu immune to such polarization. We see forces between and within our traditions that seek to affirm our identity by finding a part of our family to blame and expel. I will only know who I am when I defend myself against something that is other seems to be the mantra of defense. There have been moments of hopefulness about Christian unity. The Edinburgh Missionary Conference of 1910 brought Protestant and Anglican Christians together to explore mission and unity and had a deep sense of optimism about global evangelization within a century. The World Council of Churches was established in the 1940s with the vision to, quote, bear witness together in common allegiance to Jesus Christ's search for that unity which Christ wills for his one and only church and cooperate in matters which require common statements and actions. The WCC continues to seek unity, ways to foster visible unity. The Second Vatican Council proclaimed the desire for the unity of churches in Unitatis Redintegratio as a principal concern of the Council. 
It recognized signs of the church and the ecclesial communities of other faith traditions and the unity of the people of God. This ecumenical openness was a springboard for renewed dialogues that continue to this day through bilateral dialogues with Anglicans, Lutherans, and Reformed traditions, and was the springboard for the Anglican Roman Catholic International Commission established in the late 1960s. However, the enthusiasm of the 20th century for Christian unity has waned considerably. The expectation that we could find a way past or through our denominational differences and witness to our unity in Christ has floundered on theological and denominational particularities. New social issues added layers of complexity. Women in leadership and ordination and human sexuality questions from birth control to abortion to homosexuality and marriage provided new pressures on diversity. What had briefly seemed like unimaginable unity between Anglicans and Roman Catholics over the Eucharist and the nature of ministry in the final report of Archic I stumbled when Anglicans began to ordain women as presbyters and then bishops. We also find ourselves facing a curious situation where our foundational principles and theological commitments are mutually recognizable but our ways of discerning and applying moral teaching differ at times radically. And this is not just an inter-church reality. These issues have deepened internal divisions in the Anglican communion as different parts of the global church have disagreed with one another over moral discernment and actions taken. The roots of our traditions in the understanding of diocesan boundaries and episcopal authority and the nature of our churches are shared. However, those are breaking down and have broken down, leading to parallel jurisdictions based on theological or doctrinal stances. And I must admit that Anglicans are beginning to look to Roman Catholics to say, how do you do it with your relationships with the, the Orthodox and other um, groups within the Catholic family? <clears throat> that have parallel jurisdictions. Some call this time the ecumenical winter, as the optimism of the Edinburgh Conference and post-Vatican II dialogues faded in the face of new challenges. Is Christian unity still our aim? Is it so far off we should never aspire to it? And are there signs of hope that the work of Christian unity is actually making a difference. Well, as a bishop and as an ecumenist, my answer is a resounding yes. In fact, our work towards unity is more critical than ever. It is demanded by the gospel and is a place of profound witness in a world that believes that ongoing polarization is its salvation when it will only be our destruction. So where are these signs of hope? Well, let me begin with a very personal reflection. In my upbringing on the western side of this country, Roman Catholics were a strange and foreign community. I had only one friend in my entire schooling who was Roman Catholic. And we certainly rarely, if ever, spoke of our church experiences. And my nurturing in faith in my teens and early 20s took me into the evangelical side of the church, where, frankly, Roman Catholics were viewed through Protestant critical lenses and the Reformation that was, of course, pure and good. When I arrived as a young priest, as a member of the Anglican Roman Catholic Dialogue of Canada, I had much to learn and quickly found myself drawn into a deep appreciation for Roman Catholic theology through sitting at the feet of people like Margaret O'Gara, Jean-Marie Thiard, Terry Prendergast, Eugene Fairweather, John Baycroft, and others. I realized the depth of our shared history and liturgies 
and theological commitments and realized our differences were much more limited than I had previous, previously thought. I even came to understand the gift of a universal primacy as a good for the church that could be contemplated. My appreciation for the formation that the Roman Catholic Church continues to offer and give to its families, a profound reverence for liturgy and the sense of the church for the whole world have been nurtured through deep friendships, especially working with Archbishop Don Bolin, who has, was co-chair with me of the ARC Dialogue, and a, as I became a member of ARCIC in 2011. I've continued to wrestle with the documents of Archic II on authority and particularly Mary, Grace, and Hope, which for an evangelical Anglican is a, a stretch. And personally, with the colloquy of Mary in the Ignatian spiritual exercises that I had the wonderful opportunity to do at Loyola House on a uh, Sabbath leave. Each of these engaged transformed my appreciation for the richness of God's people in faith. So if an evangelical Anglican can have her eyes opened and her prejudices transformed by dialogue and friendship, there is hope. But there are other signs of hope. If you have had the opportunity to worship in a tradition other than your own, you may have discovered how often our liturgies have deep shared roots. And in fact, occasionally I am struck by a visitor who drops into church and isn't quite sure which tradition they're in. <laughs> Anglicans and Roman Catholics can worship together and sense the shape of the liturgy and the shape of God's presence in the liturgy very readily. In the gathering, the scriptures, the confession, thanksgiving, reception of Eucharist in the worship with music that has its roots in the ancient liturgies of the early church. We are sacramental in our worship and sharing the gifts in the, of the sacraments in maybe slightly different ways, but we are not alone. Many other denominations share an understanding of the Lord's Supper as important, differing in frequency and priority, but still practiced and still important. We share a liturgical calendar amongst many denominations. And I, I frankly have found it slightly amusing to discover the keeping of Advent and Advent wreaths in denominations that previously decried such practices very strongly. I was in a, a church that has roots in the uh, Brethren community over Christmas and they had a, a lineup of four candles named Hope, Joy, Love and Peace. I said, my goodness, that looks an awful lot like an Advent wreath to me. The human need for tangible expressions of faith in life transcends denominational lines and the fluidity of denominational commitment and the experience of multi-denominational schools of theology have allowed for rich sharing of the gifts that each tradition has received and are found moving back and forth across those denominational lines. I see hope and the devotional practice of many Christians. Over the past 40 years, I've seen barriers break down between Catholics and Protestants as practices of prayer are shared and engaged in, especially as Pro Protestants have received the gifts of the practice of spiritual direction, Ignatian prayer and retreats, and contemplative meditative practices. And many Anglicans have as many Roman Catholic writers on their shelves as Anglicans. Current leaders such as Richard Rohr and of course Pope Francis are read widely and looked to for leadership in faith development. And even a papal encyclical receives wide circulation. Laudato Si has quoted by people of many faiths as we wrestle with our relationship with creation. Although the idea of a pope is criticized by many Christians, the witness of the current pontiff is appreciated by many as he speaks to human hearts in the language of faith 
And maybe it is a small first fruit towards recognizing universal primacy. If you look at the music used in churches these days, it used to be that you know a denomination would have its own denominational hymn book and it would sit in the pews and that's what the whole worship would be from. Well, these days, everybody's got screens and it actually doesn't matter where the music comes if the music expresses the heart of faith. And I think that the richness of music and liturgy is being shared much more broadly. And uh, I, I remember myself uh, when, I, when I brought in the gather book into a congregation where I was because I felt there was some beautiful music there that we had not been exposed to and it could enrich our worship life. I only had one man who opened it up, saw it was Roman Catholic, slammed it shut, never opened it again. <laughs> but he was in the minority, by, I promise you. <laughs> and of course, shared ministry. I still remember World Youth Day in Toronto some years ago when the local Roman Catholic churches needed billets for thousands of young people from around the world. And we, as the ministerial, were invited to join in. And I delighted in hosting two young women from India, hearing each night of their experiences during this event and sharing in some of the activities. And of course, the critical issues of our day demand our visible unity and shared advocacy, whether that's refugee sponsorship, poverty, or other current issues. As the Bishop of Huron, I was asked to support a local initiative for a safe injection site here in the city of London. But the essential research needed for that advocacy had all been done by the Sisters of St. Joseph and was excellent. And so it was shared widely with all seeking to advocate with politicians and municipal authorities. And I know that out of the cold programs, although they may be physically held in one congregation's building, the volunteers will often be ecumenical in nature, drawn together by a common commitment to care for those in need. After almost 40 years, well, more than 40 years now, bilateral dialogue between Anglicans and Roman Catholics, there have been many important texts produced but those texts often sit on the shelves of seminaries and libraries and rarely reach the levels of congregations. And there has been a deep desire to see that change, to see the work of the dialogues reach people in the pews. The meeting of bishops from around the world of Anglican and Roman Catholic bishops in Mississauga in 1999 led to the establishment of the International Anglican Roman Catholic Commission for Unity and Mission. We love our acronyms, IARCM. Is the <laughs> and they published in 2007 a document called Growing Together in Unity and Mission. And it was a description of our current agreements and encouraged four particular ways to build on those. To find, to, it was an invitation to visible expressions of our shared faith. We're invited to study the faith together in Bible study, in common shared study groups. To cooperate in ministry together and to share witness in the world. In the Anglican Roman Catholic Dialogue in Canada, the last project that I worked on with the dialogue before I resigned uh, in late last year, we wanted to share where signs of hope were being expressed. And so we sought out stories on the ground that would illustrate some of the documents of Arctic II in particular. And they have been published online and under the title, New Stories to Tell. One of those stories is here in London. I have always been impressed when I've talked to the Reverend Kevin George and his wife, Catherine Ann, for the way in which they live out interchurch marriage. Most often, when a couple come to be married and they belong to different churches, 
there's a kind of subtle pressure to kind of choose where you're going to be. And it's going to be so much easier when you have kids to be in one or the other. But Catherine Ann and Kevin made the choice to live fully continuing in the tradition in which they had been raised and nurtured. They were not encouraged in that by their bishops or the leaders who spoke to them as they were preparing for marriage. They were asked, are you sure? Like, this is going to be hard. But they, over the life of their marriage, have been deeply committed to one another and to supporting one another in their ministries. Kevin is the priest of St. Aidan's Church here in London. Catherine Ann is a chaplain at Brescia College and a naval chaplain in the Naval Reserve. They demonstrate the document that was worked on by the Anglican Roma and Roman Catholic bishops in Canada about interchurch marriage, that it is possible, it is supported by the bishops and encouraged. I think of the story of poverty advocacy in Edmonton, where the Bishop of the Diocese of Edmonton and Roman Catholics and others in the city are advocating strongly on issues of poverty and have a place at the table with the municipal authorities. I think of the covenant between the Diocese of Capel, the Anglican Diocese of Capel, and the Diocese of Regina, the Roman Catholic Diocese of Regina, that was signed in 2011, in which they covenanted to study together, to pray together, to build visible unity together. And it led to a joint conference on the diaconate last year that has now published a full um, book of papers on the diaconate through that conference. And that covenant is now being joined by the Lutherans in the area. Anglicans and Lutherans in the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Canada are in full communion. And so it was a natural step to invite them to participate in that covenant. And I think of the story of the Anglican Church of Canada as it has wrestled with the question of the marriage of same-sex couples. And when we were working on a, um, a document uh, called, um, sorry, I'm just having this holy estate. We were being asked to look at various aspects of this, and one of the aspects was our ecumenical partnerships. And so we invited the Roman Catholic partners in the Anglican Roman Catholic dialogue to offer us their reflection as part of our. And they said that was the first time that another church had been invited into the internal dialogue of, an, of a church. These are not juridical or institutional changes to the official policies of our churches, which are still in dialogue. They are experiential living into agreements already reached or that are in process of discernment. They are breaking down barriers through personal experience and relationships. And they are each a sign of hope. The same processes of meeting together, praying together, Discussing differences, exploring scripture together are at the heart of internal Anglican practice. Later this year, the Lambeth Conference of Bishops from around the world will meet in Canterbury to discuss key issues. And I have just come from the primates of the Anglican Communion doing the same. We are a people created for relationships, for human interaction where the nuances of beliefs and experience can be expressed and understood. And so often I am reminded that my belief about the other has been shaped by assumptions and prejudices that I had not realized were present until we sat down at the table together. The only way to dismantle them is through direct engagement, honest dialogue, a focus on our shared commitment to Christ, and most of all, prayer together. It is hard to hate or exclude the sister or brother I have prayed for and with. In Matthew 18, we have Jesus recorded saying, wherever two or three are gathered in my name, there am I with them. 
That is the sign of hope I look for. However small, and maybe seemingly insignificant in the face of the rhetoric of those who are caught in fear of the other, or in the face of those who seek certainty, however small, I see those signs of hope all around me. The small lamps on the hill lighting the darkness, a darkness that will not win. Thanks be to God. So we have time for um, some dialogue, and I hope we will engage in that. I would ask you, if you have questions or, uh, to ask, um, please come to one of the mics. So there's this one here. There's a cordless mic that is uh, also on a stand there, but we can bring that into the crowd if uh, need be, okay? So uh, I will manage that one, and um, anyone please uh, stand up. So we are recording this evening. I'm hoping we'll be able to share that. Um, and uh, um, so that's why we'd like you to use the mic to, uh, to enter into dialogue. Silence. <laughs> um, there's some. There's been some joint statements on uh, baptism, Eucharist, and ministry, mm -hmm. and on the nature of salvation. And I'm not sure who you know who all was involved in those joint statements, but I, I'm assuming you're aware of that, and uh, um, I don't know if you, if you can tell us what sure. the uh, joint statement on salvation is, but I thought it was, I think it's between Lutherans and Anglicans and, and Catholics. And well, there's a couple of different ones. There, there's certainly, um, there was what's called the BEM document, Baptism, Eucharist, and Ministry. That was a broader uh, ecumenical document um, Anglicans and Roman Catholics had, in Archic I, produced a final report that um, described remarkable agreement on the nature of ministry and on the Eucharist, which was a big surprise to some Anglicans that we could agree on that. Um, and, and one of the challenges is these documents are, are, are created by an official dialogue of theologians and bishops and lay people who've been chosen by their respective communions to, to have that dialogue. Then the process of what we call reception is required, which means that it has to be received by the, the churches. Now, I believe Archic I did get uh, official primatur from both Anglicans and Roman Catholics. The Archic II documents, there are five statements of Archic II um, that were initially published separately and then Archic Three was asked to put them together in one book, which we've done, um, <coughs> included uh, church as communion, salvation in the church, um, authority, uh, the gift of authority, Mary, grace, and hope, and I'm missing one. Uh, so those five were published, but they have not um, received official uh, reception. One of the challenges is the Roman Catholic Church has a very clear process for official reception through the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith. Anglican polity is much more dispersed and reception is actually going to be seen more by what happens on the ground than by official statements. So these are some of the things we negotiate as churches. Um, the Lutheran Church and the Roman Catholic Church have an agreement on justification by faith that was done, was it 10 years ago? Yeah, and again, that was a bit of a surprise that, uh, to many, but the Lutherans and Roman Catholics had been in a long time dialogue about that, and it was a remarkable achievement to have that published. Uh, all of those documents will be available in your local theological library. <laughs> They're also online, vatican.ca has all of the documents are available for downloading. And uh, so you can download them without having to buy a book. 
I was excited to hear about this Capel Regina mm -hmm. uh, covenant and its work on Diakon. I look forward to uh, you know studying that. Uh, I'm wondering, can you tell us when you mentioned the Anglican Lutheran agreement? Uh, is that the Waterloo Declaration? The full communion agreement is the Waterloo Declaration. Yeah. Ca can we point to any particular? Um, concrete fruit of that? Have oh, we yes, seen absolutely. Yep. Besides just agreements, uh, yep. what, what, how has that changed life on the ground for Anglicans? Well, it's Lutheran? changed it quite significantly because uh, Lutheran and Anglican clergy can, uh, can minister in either denomination. Uh, so in fact, I was talking to somebody today in Winnipeg who said he thought he had more Lutherans uh, serving Anglican parishes than Anglicans. <laughs> And vice versa, he had, he had uh, Anglicans serving Lutheran parishes in the Winnipeg area. Um, and uh, when I was the area bishop of Trent Durham in the Diocese of Toronto, um, was in desperate need of an interim uh, priest for a very difficult situation. And there was a Lutheran priest right there in the area who was available and, and was a wonderful gift to that congregation. So that kind of sharing of ministry, we have a large a number, or not large, I, I don't know exactly how many, but we have quite a few shared Lutheran Anglican congregations where there may be a Lutheran pastor or it may be an Anglican priest, but the congregation is a joint Anglican Lutheran congregation and they determine through a process of, of uh, discernment uh, how they want to share that ministry. Like, would they have two Sundays of Anglican liturgy and two Sundays of Lutheran? Or, you know, what the nature of that sharing is depends on the congregation. There's one in Midland. There's one in Toronto. Um, there's a, a number of them in the prairies. Yeah. So there's there's quite a lot of back and forth. So for, uh, we had a joint assembly of the National Council of the Lutherans and the Anglican General Synod in 2013, and we're planning another one in 2022. In the next few weeks, uh, if, if you come to Huron College on Tuesday night, <coughs> the uh, presiding bishop of the Lutheran Church National Bishop Susan Johnson and I will be uh, uh, present for a, an evening on uh, our relationship with Muslims in which we will sign a common word, which is a document that invites Christians and Muslims to enter into reading scripture together, into studying the common word that is between us as Abrahamic faiths. And so wherever possible, Susan and I try to to make statements together as leaders of denominations that are in full communion with each other. Uh, we are having a joint meeting of our national councils in March. Um, we have a joint staff consultation coming up. So it's a constant working at what does it take to show that we are, we are working together. Even though we're not merging our denominations, but we're saying that we have sufficient agreement on the essentials of faith and worship and ministry that we can live together and share together for the common good of our churches in their locations. And particularly these days in, in rural and isolated places where you, you, you can't afford to have separate buildings and clergy and for everybody. Um, surely at that moment, what's needed is a, a witness to visible unity that says, we're willing to do this. So there's lots going on on the ground. Yeah. One of my presenters when I was ordained as a bishop was a, was a Lutheran. Uh, he'd been a colleague in the ministerial with me and we had a very close working relationship and I wanted to witness to that unity in my consecration and so asked him if he would be one of my presenters. Yeah. Sorry? I mean, there's certainly friendships between Lutheran and Anglican parishes. I'm not sure, I don't, we don't have any shared ministries at this time. Um, there's a stronger relationship in the KW area because more Lutherans over there. <laughs> uh, it, it does depend a little bit on the number of Lutherans you have. So people in Newfoundland kind of have a bit of a problem because there aren't any Lutherans in Newfoundland. Newfoundland. <laughs> but certainly in the KW area where there've been traditional Lutheran emigration and in certainly in the prairies. Yes, I uh, 
my perceptive my perceptive see it a little bit as a parish priest in small towns and the people are just ignoring all the dialogues and they're just working together yeah yeah i mean <laughs> you know you get into a small town mm -hmm. they're not going to have 14 <clears throat> food banks mm -hmm. they're going to work together yeah. you know they're going to have lunches together they're going to have things together and you know the women's group they had their little ecumenical luncheon because they're not going to wait for the per for the churches to have <laughs> little dialogues to celebrate the unity yeah. and i think that's that's really where it's going to come from i know well, usually change comes from the grassroots it comes yeah. from people saying that you know those people up there they don't know what they're talking about <laughs> yeah no i know i know you know 50 60 years ago sometimes if there was a funeral, mm -hmm. you'd have neighbors that lived together for 50, 60 years, farmed together. Mm -hmm. And in some parishes, the people weren't supposed to go into each other's mm -hmm. churches, yeah. so they'd stand in the parking lot during the funeral. Yeah. That doesn't happen anymore. Like yeah. uh, mm -hmm. if I have a funeral today, yeah. everybody comes who knows the persons and we pray together. Yeah. And we, I always invite them to pray for unity among our churches. And I always welcome them in. And, and that's just happening all over the yeah. place. Yeah. And There's lots of, um, uh, that one of the stories in the new stories to tell uh, was of a man who remembers as a child um, going to a funeral and his father, and they were Roman Catholic and they were going to a funeral in, a, in a, an Anglican church. And, um, and his father saying, well, we can go in, but we're not praying here. <laughs> and, and he remembers that. And... Uh, and and re remembers now how different it is. <clears throat> yeah. My father had the same experience. He worked with a guy who belonged to some strange religion called Lutheranism. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and he really, this guy really helped him get started. Mm -hmm. And he died. Mm -hmm. And he asked his priest if he could go to the funeral. And he said, well, it would be better if you didn't. But don't look like you're praying too much if you're there. <laughs> <laughs> Just reflecting back on your beginning when you were talking about the long history of Christians and the splits and the disagreements and the conflicts and how that's evolved and ramified and escalated and become worldwide. There's a lot of unity in that. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering, if we looked at ourselves in the reflection of our Lord and our Father and in the love of the Holy Spirit, would it be different than when Jesus was trying to correct his disciples? <laughs> at what point is the dialogue about ecumenical union shift to reconciliation? At what point does one say, we all own a, own a responsibility to heal, and to heal the people that actually maybe we're the ones need healing. Mm. And so I, I just I just wonder how much the dialogue gets to that. It's like with all the reconciliation that was talked about, about missing and, and murdered indigenous women, mm. the rubber hits the road when it goes beyond that and says, all the talk, all the talk, but like there are still people in Grassy Narrows mm -hmm. who don't have clean water. Yeah. So... I'm just wondering, where does the real dialogue happen? Like from, from the level you're working? Well, I think, um, you know, there are people who say that the bilateral dialogues are just kind of a waste of time because they go on forever and ever and what happens. Um, I, I've been on Arctic 3 and we use the process of receptive ecumenism, which is recognizing that um, the stumbling blocks of the ordination of women uh, is going to be a huge stumbling block for, uh, it's not foreseeable that that's going to change on either side. Anglicans aren't going to give it up and at the moment Roman Catholics have not indicated any, any willingness to change that. So we're walking side by side, but what we can do as we walk side by side is to examine ourselves in the presence of the other and ask what we could learn from the other because because we are not perfect by any means. We are institutions 
given grace by God, but very human in many ways. And so what is it we can see in the other that might be a gift to us? And so Archic 3 in its ecclesiology uh, book, it was quite a long document, um, took the approach of looking uh, at the, our structures and how we discern and, and asked what could we see in the other that we might learn from. And so that was a small step. It was hard. It was hard. It means being able to say, yeah, this isn't working for us. <laughs> and um, to be able to say that in the presence of the other and then say, you know, we see something here that we'd like to learn more about. Uh, so, I, so I do see some small progress in being able to say that, uh, that uh, our churches have to continue to develop and evolve in ways that will help us live the gospel fully. The question of visible unity, is that about us all merging into one church? I, I personally don't think that's where we're headed. I think what we want is the kind of visible unity that can be grateful for the ways in which each of us expresses the gospel, but not turn that into a reason for hating the other and dividing and making space for some intersection at the edges. Um, now, it's not without some hard work on doctrinal definitions, on listening to our theological understandings, absolutely. But many people will say, why should I believe what you're telling me about the gospel when you folks can't get it together? Uh, I mean, that's quite a common response. So I think we have some work to do to say, you're right. Um, we're not perfect. And learning to live with someone who is other than I and see the gifts in what they bring is going to be a, a large part of our move towards, um, towards a visible way of expressing the good news. Yes. Oh, there we go. Okay. Uh, FYI, I'm a strange Lutheran. Oh, okay. Okay. Welcome. <laughs> um, uh, some years ago, I saw a TV program about uh, ecumenism, and Rowan Williams was being interviewed. And the question posed to him was, okay, you sit down with someone from a different faith background. How do you get started? And I, I loved his answer. He said, okay, tell me about God. Now, I'm just wondering, have you ever had the misfortune of talking with someone whose definition of God was so at odds that ecumenism was just out of the question, or very difficult, mm -hmm. to say the least? I, ha <clears throat> I haven't had that experience, but I can, I can imagine that happening. Um, I, I possibly have had that experience when I've read people from a tradition whose whose boundaries are so uh, narrow around their understanding or their definition of God and their place for people in the church that, um, that I would find it difficult. I think what I would want to say is, what gives you joy? What gives you joy? And where is God in that joy? And then to wait and listen long enough to hear an answer to that. I would want to be very careful about the fact that my own understanding of God has grown and shifted and changed as, of, as I've grown. And that any attempt to put God in a single box and assume that I know it all is by definition heresy. So I need to be very cautious that I allow space to listen for someone else's experience of God and knowledge of God. And also not assume that they have to be where I am. That takes a lot of grace, it takes a lot of 
personal grace and, and corporate grace to leave that space open. Um, for some people, that's not a place they can live. It's too uncomfortable. And I think then we, we simply say, uh, well, I do have an experience of something like that. Uh, I was living in southwestern Ontario as a student chaplain at what was then Southwestern Regional Centre for the Developmentally Handicapped, long since gone now. But um, I, was, I was boarding with a family there. They were out, and a knock came on the door, and there were two people standing there looking really eager. And I knew immediately that they were probably Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, and knocking on the door, and they had their tracts in their hand, and um, they started into their spiel, and I said, well, you know, I, I hear you, but, uh, but I have my own faith, and I'm very happy with it. And, and they went into their spiel again. <laughs> um, but towards the end, I said, you know, you know uh, we're not going to agree on this, but could we pray together for each other? And it was like, oh, they simply could not even imagine praying with me. And I was kind of shocked because I thought, at the very least, I thought we could say a prayer for each other and recognize we're not in the same place. But, um, and it, I, I was sad about that. I was sad that that was not possible. Um, so there are boundaries for some people that are just not able to shift or move to make space. Um, I am sure we will be surprised when we get to the kingdom about who's there. <laughs> when I look at this world, every human being on this planet was created by God. As such, we're all brothers and sisters and we have much in common. Let's not focus on our differences, but let's us common, focus on our common values, and there are many that we all share as human beings and as brothers. My God tells me, love God and love your neighbor. When I was a kid, my neighbors were all white, French, Canadian Catholics. There were no Protestants in my neighborhood, and we didn't dare walk by a Protestant church. My neighborhood is not like that anymore. I've got Jews, I've got Muslims, I've got all kinds of people from different cultures. My God tells me, love your neighbor. Let's focus on our common values and work together because we can achieve much more by working together and then gradually be respectful of each other and our beliefs and work together for the good of our brothers and sisters. Yes, absolutely, yeah. One of the things that, that as Anglicans, we've had some, as I said before, bitter divisions within the Anglican communion. And people will say, for instance, I couldn't possibly have communion with you because we disagree on this issue. And I think one of the things that I was grateful to see in a recent paper about the nature of our Anglican communion is that we're not called to the Eucharist because we like each other. <laughs> we're not called to the Eucharist because we agree with each other. We've been called by Christ to the Eucharist, regardless of who's on either side of us. And whether I like them or whether I agree with them or whether I think they're heretical or whether I think they're doctrinally unsound, if Christ has called them to the Eucharist and Christ has called me to the Eucharist, then I owe them respect. I owe them a willingness to listen. And I owe them the courtesy of being as reconciled as far as possible as I can with them. Our communion is not a communion created by because we agree with each other. Our communion is created because we are in communion with Christ first. And then we try and work out what that means living in this world in an incarnated way. And we've sometimes worked that out differently. And we've put the emphasis in different places or we've said that these things are central and not these things and others have shaped that a little differently. Um, sometimes the people you fight the most with are your siblings, <laughs> not the people who are completely different. And so it's figuring out how do we live together 
and hold together at the table of Christ while we work it out and try to witness to that visible unity that's not about uniformity. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. I'm curious as someone who identifies as being female, um, mm -hmm. as you've navigated through um, your leadership journey um, in the church, um, have there been any particularly memorable moments that you've had to navigate as you've walked hallways that are traditionally male or in environments mm -hmm. where there may not be a female voice? How have you handled that with grace or humor or have you been able to manage those situations? Well, I, as I said, I've just come from the primates meeting. <laughs> well, I was the only woman in the room. <laughs> um, I was not at the very forefront of women being ordained in Canada in the Anglican Church, so I didn't have to live with some of the really, what I would say was quite nasty and often unchristian behavior that went with that. However, that doesn't mean that everybody uh, was, was fully ready for the leadership of women. It took some time, and, and by the time I came into leadership, one of the challenges was that, uh, that people knew it wasn't politically correct to say that you were against it. And so the opposition took other kinds, other forms. Um, in one parish I was in, there was a group of older men who, when I thought about it later, I realized that they had never ever had a woman in their lives who had had any kind of authority over them. And I was the rector of the parish. I was significantly younger than all of them. And, and I realized later that, th that that was a much harder thing for them to wrestle with than I gave credit for. I thought we were just arguing about the issues. <laughs> and I, I had to come to realize that there were some dynamics in that that were not about the issue, they were about me and uh, uh, how they would relate to that. How you navigate that, um, I think you have to be yourself. You can't be anyone else. And I also know that, that I also wrestled with how much of being female in leadership is particular to that and how much is it just who you are because of your upbringing, your nature, your gifts, your personality. And I came to the conclusion you can't really separate them. You have been raised and socialized and formed and nurtured in particular ways and some of that includes because you were female, but some of it was just because you like chocolate milk and you don't like this. I mean it's it's not it's not because it's not all because you're female. And you have to own your own gifts and your own weaknesses, and you have to know yourself well. Um, you have to know the context in which you're working. And, and there are times when you, uh, when I was first ordained, I was in a, a clericus, which is our gathering of the clergy in a geographic area that would meet on a monthly basis. I was the only woman in the clericus. And I have to tell you, when I look back on it now, I thought, why didn't I stand up to some of those guys about the misogynist jokes? And I thought, well, partly it was because I was young, I was new, I was, you know, get finding my place in ministry, and I didn't want to be defined by being oppositional on that as the, the main feature. And I made a choice. Some of my female colleagues made different choices and stood up in different ways. But uh, that was a choice I made at the time. I might make it differently now, I don't know. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think owning who you are, knowing the context and deciding what is the most important thing in this context? Is it to stand up for the rights of women to be in this space and to have uh, a voice? Or is there um, a larger uh, common good here that you need to give leadership to? And um, by the time I became a bishop, it wasn't really a huge issue. I mean, it, there were many, there had been several, I guess I was the fourth woman bishop in Canada, in the Anglican Church of Canada. Um, so yeah, does that give you a little bit of insight into how I navigated it? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Well, uh, uh, funny stories. Hmm. 
I, I do remember a male colleague commenting on what I was wearing one day, and I thought, and I remember thinking, you wouldn't have done that if I were male. You just thought it was okay because I was female. Um, there were also those who, who took uh, physical liberties that you had to put a clear, poo, no, we're not going there. You know, the boundaries are here. And you had to be really clear about the boundaries. Um, a funny story is that as a curate, uh, as a young priest in a shared ministry, um, usually in the Anglican tradition, the young curate is male and single and gets invited out to dinner all the time. If you come into the parish as a young curate and female, well, you can cook. <laughs> like, I virtually never got invited out to a meal. <clears throat> Although I remember one day at the coffee hour being introduced to this woman's adult son and later realizing that I think there was a subtext there that I missed. <laughs> Uh, so, th yeah, there are some, some humorous ones. <laughs> and, of course, the people who, who have a joke at a parish event, a, you know, a social event, they were having some dancing, and, and one of the wardens said, I've never danced with the priest before. <laughs> <laughs> so you get those kind of uh, moments as well. Yeah. <laughs> I have a question that's, um, that's kind of sprung from Mo's question earlier and, and your opening comments. And it's uh, around uh, social media mm. and our ability to stay in a silo or among people that are, that are like-minded and not engage in dialogue. And I, I just wonder if how technology mm -hmm. maybe has entered into ecumenical dialogue has either helped or, or hindered, if you maybe have some experience or comments on that. Well, I think it does both. I mean, I think it helps in the fact that virtually uh, many Christian leaders or organizations have to engage in social media in order to share messages, <coughs> which means it's there for the, for the whole public to see, which means that, you know, if the Pope says something, we hear it because somebody, you know, retweets or puts on Facebook or Instagram or wherever um, an article and you get a chance to read it. So there, there's, a, there's a crossing of denominational boundaries very readily with those kinds of things that get shared. Um, but it also is the place where people can rant and share um, views that are usually in a short rant because they don't want to, you, know, you know, it's not a long space. It's not a space created for real thoughtfulness. And, um, and some of it can be very nasty and harmful and uh, I'm not sure there's much we can do about that. We've been taken over by it, <clears throat> other than to be very careful about how we use social media. Uh, I have a Facebook account, and I, but I'm very clear that I'm, I'm on it as a bishop of the Anglican Church of Canada. And when I share stuff, it's because I think there's some value in it or there's, there's a message in it that I would like to share or it's something that I want to say and affirm um, but, you know, it's, yeah, I'm very careful about what that is because there are clear boundaries and what's appropriate. I think the, the negative use is that it also means that, um, people who want to take a particular position and be divisive can also do that. And we've certainly seen that, um, Spreading information that isn't accurate, uh, it's very hard to get at sharing um, a, a fuller picture that's true. <coughs> uh, so I think we're, if we're good or ill, it's part of our lives. And the only question now is how will you use it, both for the common good of the wider community, for the good of the church, and for the glory of God, so that it's not... Uh, denigrating other people, that it's consistent with the, the great commandment to love God and love neighbor, uh, and, and then ask, you know, can it be useful as a tool, but be cautious. Yeah. Something that would, uh, I think, revolutionize the Catholic Church would be if we, if lay people could choose their priests and uh, 
they're bishops, and I, I, I work as a spiritual director. I have three Anglican priests I'm working with, and uh, I've learned that Anglicans know how to do this. And can you just explain how that works? <laughs> well, we hope the Holy Spirit is in it somewhere. <laughs> um, is it a better system? I, I, I mean, it, it certainly is a system that is based on the voice of laity and clergy within a diocese or within a parish uh, being able to discern together. So for parishes, it's a combined process in most dioceses between the parish um, discerning what it needs at this moment in its life, what its vision is, what its mission is, what are its deepest concerns at this time, uh, what, you know, what can it afford and all sorts of things. And then um, the bishop uh, works to create a list of potential candidates. That list of candidates comes either because somebody phones up and says, Bishop, I would really like to be considered for that parish. And the bishop can say, well, I'm not prepared to release you from where you are at the moment because I need you there. Or the bishop can say, um, yes, I think you might be at a time when you could make a move and I'd be prepared to consider you on that list. Um, people, uh, the parishioners can sometimes say, you know, we would really like to have, you know, priest X. Uh, again, the bishop has to discern, are they ready to leave where they are? Um, and sometimes the bishop phones people and says, I think you need to leave where you are. <laughs> and I would like you to consider letting your name stand on this list. And then the parish gets a list of, of candidates. Um, and processes are slightly different in different places, but oftentimes the candidates have seen the profile of the parish and have had a chance to say, yes, I've read the profile. I think I might have the gifts for this ministry. And uh, they go on the list then to be interviewed. The parish has a selection committee of lay people um, hopefully representing the breadth of the parish, who interview the candidates, and at the end of the interview process, phone the bishop and say, Bishop, after listening to all of these candidates, going out to hear them preach in wherever they are currently, we would like you to appoint X. And the bishop then phones X and says, you know, they, they have asked for you as their parish priest, and are you willing to accept the appointment? The bishop does not like it, if you get to that point in the process and the person says, no. <laughs> the peop if they've been through the interview, it's a mutual interview. If they've been through the interview, they're expected to speak up and say, I don't think this is the right place for me and let the bishop know that ahead of time. So by the time you get to that last stage, it should be a yes on both sides, unless there's some mitigating factor that you haven't realized uh, at that point. In, in a Episcopal election process, there are uh, qualifications. Uh, people have to have been ordained and in ministry for a certain length of time and there will be a profile for the diocese uh, and then there's usually a process by which members of the synod, which is lay and clergy people, uh, lay people elected in each parish according to the size of the parish and the cleric of the parish, can nominate a cleric either from within their own diocese or from another one possibly. And uh, assuming there are no reasons that they don't qualify, they would be put on the list of potential candidates. In the last, I've been in a lot of elections <laughs> for a variety of reasons, and in the last 10 years, there's been quite a shift to giving opportunity for more fulsome exploration with the candidates. So often the candidates will be asked to write something to answer a series of questions to give, them, give you a sense of what they might say on certain issues. Um, it can include uh, video recorded responses to questions which gives you a sense of what do they sound like and how do they speak. And sometimes it includes meeting the candidates in a kind of parish hall setting where they can present for a few minutes and then there's a chance to ask them questions one on one. At the end of that, the synod gathers, laity and clergy separately, in, I mean in the same building at the same time, but maybe sitting on either side of a church, and they vote by ballot, secret ballot. Um, these days, they often in large dioceses will use electronic clickers, really fast then. <laughs> uh, in the old days, <laughs> 
paper ballots, so you'd file up and deposit your ballot in the right box. Somebody goes away and has to count those and come back and announce the results of the ballot. And uh, depending on the rules in the diocese, <coughs> the people at the bottom may choose to stay on or they may choose to drop out at that point. And you keep, you go through the ballot again until you get the required majority that that diocese has determined is necessary. In most of the really large dioceses, it's a simple majority in both houses. In some dioceses, it's two thirds majority in both houses. Um, the process is usually framed with a Eucharist. It's meant to be prayerful. There's meant to be time for prayer during the, the process. <coughs> But, you know, like any human process, it'll have its political aspects. Um, is it better than a straight appointment? In the Church of England, uh, the Church Appointments Committee uh, works with some members of the diocese, uh, interviews candidates, and then appoints somebody. The queen appoints the person. Um, but it seems to work. I think in North America, we're used to a more uh, quote, democratic process, and so people want to have a say. At the end of an election, it's often, often there's a motion to make it unanimous so that all the ballots are destroyed and nobody really remembers after that what the thing. The, the hard part now with social media is that when you're in the middle of the process, people are tweeting out the results, which it, it used to be that you were sequestered and nothing was announced until the bishop was elected or the person, who, whatever you were doing, which party you were doing. Um, nowadays, you can sit there and um, get the results uh, on each ballot, which is it's hard on the candidates, very hard on the candidates. If you've allowed yourself to publicly be placed in this process, knowing that out of 10 candidates, only one is going to be elected, there's going to be nine people who have to go back to their parish the next morning, and their parish is going to be going, so why wasn't he good enough or she good enough? It's hard. And it's, it's putting yourself out publicly in a way that's um, quite challenging. So if you hear of an Episcopal election, pray for all of the candidates. <laughs> um, uh, the diocese here, the, my successor is the Bishop of Huron, is being consecrated on Saturday at St. Paul's Cathedral. It's a public service. If you want to come and see how we do it, uh, you're most welcome. Uh, but Todd Townsend, Dr. Todd Townsend, the, the uh, Dean of Theology at Huron College was elected. And uh, so he will be consecrated on and installed. He gets to be installed in the cathedral. I didn't get that because the cathedral was shut down at the time. It was deemed unsafe. <laughs> so that's a very long answer to your question. I don't know if that, does that give you a sense of? It sounds process? like a, be careful what you ask for. <laughs> yeah. I wonder in the Catholic church if a lot of that happens under the table behind closed doors, right? And it's there, <laughs> but it, it happens, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. But that involvement of lay people. I'm thinking that, that uh, it sure. seems like things are winding up here. You do have a, a, a consecration coming up on the weekend. Um, I, what I, uh, just a, a word of thanks. Uh, I think that um, uh, what's been very uh, uh, wonderful about experiencing you tonight is, is that you have that deep pastoral sense, that, that really that sense of, of how to meet people in their everyday life. And really, I think that impresses me so much about your leadership. So. Um, Thank you so much for being with us. Um, please help me in offering a, a gesture of thanks. you know it's really easy so thank you so much for coming um, that there will be a video of this lecture so if you think that there's content here that you want to share with other people please do uh, point them towards our, our website um, usually it's out within a couple of, of weeks but um, yeah, probably just depends how long it takes them to get the video uh, mastered um, do take a brochure share it with other people in uh, in a few weeks time so if you want to date the day before Valentine's Day 
Uh, we have a, a, a lecture right here. I think that's the way Annette and I get dates as we come to Veritas Lecture Series. Uh, but King's own Dr. Pamela Cushing is going to present on the legacy of Jean Vanier. I'm looking forward to that and, uh, and also the emerging work of the uh, Jean Vanier Research Center that's, that's here at King's. So um, again, a, a different emphasis, but I think very rich. So please, as you're leaving this evening, remember our donation box and uh, safe journey home. Thank you for coming.